Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your co-host Greg Thompson along with his partner in crime, Aaron Quinn. Aaron, how are we doing? I'm great, man. I got to say, it was nice to meet you in person, spend some time with you. It, it was. It's it's really weird. I had the same conversation today if we're at work that in today's about society... Me? Uh, no, um, <laughs> they don't talk about me at work. Here, get fired. <laughs> um, but that it's so weird in today's society, how much you can do remotely and teleworking and email and zoom calls and everything like that and not actually meet anyone. And it's really funny. Like you spend as much time as you and I have together for the past year or so. And all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I guess I've never actually met him in person. It yeah. was it was great to actually finally uh, see your beautiful face uh, one and one. Thank you. Yeah, no, it was a, it was a lot of fun to uh, kick off training camp with you and Eric. And uh, one of the really cool things here before we jump into it too was uh, we, we always talk about this on here. We do this for fun, and we're not doing it to become famous podcasters <laughs> or sports broadcaster guys. We're just Bills fans that do it for fun and being at camp and then having people recognize and come up and talk about that. They enjoy the podcast and uh, like the work we do and shaking our hands and wanting to meet us. And that to me, like not to pat ourselves on the back at all. That was just a really cool thing uh, because we do put a lot of hard work into it. A lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes. You and I were working on our new platform the other night, all, you know, all night and I, people don't see that other side of it. So it's kind of cool to get out around fans and be able to talk about it and, and have people let you know they're interested. Yeah, no, I, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't humbling. It was pretty cool to go and, you know, sometimes we feel like we're just talking into the void and that it's just yeah. you and I rambling and we would have been doing this at the bar if we weren't doing it on YouTube. And um, I, I think that our chemistry comes from that because I think it's the kind of conversations we would have anyways, just arguing with each other um, right. there. But to find out how many people enjoy it and recognize what we do and appreciate it was uh, was very rewarding and, and reassuring that the time and effort we put into it is real. So, so to everybody who did uh, stop out to say thank you, and to stop by and, and to let us know you appreciate what we're doing. Thank you. It, it meant a lot. And uh, thank you. And then head over to coverone.net and sign up for the premium memberships because that is really what keeps this uh, whole thing going, this whole operation, not just the podcast, but all the film room breakdown, uh, all the work that goes into giving you the product that you know and expect from coverone.net. And so if you haven't, if this is your first time you're joining us here on YouTube or listening to the podcast for the first time, please make sure you head over to coverone.net. Those guys are ripping out content. Uh, this is the time of year to really get in and get that premium membership because it does last for a year. It's $20. You get it for the entire year. Uh, so I would I'd head over there now and get in on that. And then you also get in on the Slack channel, which if you're somebody that likes the YouTube, watching us on YouTube and getting involved in the chat, then you really should join the premium membership because this chat goes on 24 hours a day, seven days a week over in our Slack channel. And uh, I know that you love that and, and can hit on that a little bit more for people. No, it's it's great. It's a uh, it's a little bit of an obsession. I think that we spend a maybe an unhealthy amount of time in there, but it's it's really a community. We we go back and forth on just sharing news with each other, and I, I think that a lot of fans realize that hey, it's faster to log in to the um, Slack channel and catch up on the day of what was going on than trying to look on. ESPN or Twitter or Facebook or wherever you get your bills news from, because we literally have every topic in there. Um, and it's a contest to try to rush in and be able to, um, you know, kind of get what's going on for the day. So it's, it's an incredible group, um, really, really fun people to get to know. And like we talked about at opening the show, really build friendships. It's been a, a great community and, and wonderful to be able to talk to. Yeah, I don't like any of the people, so I won't call it. <laughs> no, I like everybody, honestly. And uh, we did a thing on Saturday night uh, where we met up with a bunch of the other podcasters and bloggers and stuff like that and, and went out and had dinner and drinks. And uh, Buff Wagon 518 who I only knew as that really, I know that he, his name's Eric, but I just know his Twitter handle and from interacting for, for years, he came out and it was great to sit there and have a conversation with him. So you really do. I feel like I've known him for years now um, because of the conversations here in the Slack channel. So definitely head over there uh, and get on that. We'll discuss that a little bit more at the end. We finally have some real Bills content to talk about, man. It's been months of just talking to you about roster positions and making up content as we go, but we actually have some stuff to, to talk about. So you want to jump right in? 
Yeah, and I'd say, you know, I, I think we can share a lot of what we saw in person, impressions people made, ups and downs, maybe how we think that trickles down. But it's probably silly not to open up with the big news of the day. And, you know, sadly, I think everybody saw that um, our prized free agent uh, signing, Mitch Morse, center from Kansas City, who did come in with a history of three concussions being formally diagnosed in the past, um, was diagnosed with an additional concussion. Um, it was diagnosed yesterday on Tuesday. Tuesday, it assumed and has been reported to have logically occurred Saturday is the only day that he's been um, in pads and ma making physical contact. So um, I, I think that it was pretty intelligently um, deduced that there was contact on Saturday, felt okay on Sunday, not enough to have formal um, symptoms to that degree, probably developed and progressed further, and then uh, was formally diagnosed yesterday on Tuesday. So uh, when he came out there, we were kind of hoping that was just a veteran rest day, but obviously it took everyone by surprise to have a second day off with the day off in between, um, and has now formally been diagnosed with his fourth concussion, um, which for anyone, just from a human standpoint, is a serious topic, because I know you brought it up in the Slack channel, Aaron, that you know it, we're probably lucky if that half the the concussions they get are formally diagnosed. So uh, it's probably naive to think that this is only his fourth. Yeah. And it's a tough topic when you start talking with people about it because they're all different and everybody's body is different. So like a guy can get his fourth and that can be just the, you know, the tipping point for that particular guy. Uh, guys can get five, 10, you know, and more, and it just not affect them in the same way. So you just don't know, there's no real precedent that you can look to and say, well, this guy had four and it ruined his career. There's no, it's so individualized. And it seems like this, this concussion, they, they died or they officially diagnosed it, but he was still in what they call stage three out of the Correct. five stages uh, and doing cardio work and being on the sidelines. So taking it's snaps. Like, yeah. It's not like he was in uh, inside, no lights, sunglasses and that first stage where you're just not allowed to expose yourself to anything. So, it seems like he's still probably able to do film work. I'm guessing if he was outside in the sun without sunglasses that he is not light sensitive. So that's a great sign. Sure. Um, he was doing, you know, running around doing things. You saw him with the sled the day before or on Sunday. Yep. Um, so the, he, it doesn't appear to be a serious concussion for him, which is great news. But yeah, it, this is definitely something for Bills fans to keep an eye on because it, it does affect every guy differently. Um, and who knows at what point does a guy say, you know, that next one is the the last one for me. I have a family, I have a wife, I have a kids. We're all human beings. And at some point, all these guys have a breaking point of how much they love football and how much they love the one brain uh, body they're given. I don't know where that point is from. I don't think it's close. We saw a lot of over probably reaction right when it happened, just because sure. he is that star free agent. You hate to see him go. And after we kind of talk about the health part of it, we can talk about the roster part of what we saw from him not being there too, which is probably scary uh, for fans too. But um, I, I don't think it's too serious that this is going to impact him this year, long term, or his career or anything. But if it were to say he, you know, just doesn't want to play football anymore, gets another one here in preseason, there are some ramifications for the Bills, and you're our go-to cap guy, and I know that you looked into it a little bit. It's just something we're not trying to be alarmists for anybody here. We just want to say, hey, you know, this is something that he, he's going to have to think about at some point. And what would those ramifications be for the Bills having just signed him to a deal? Yeah. So, so again, just to reiterate what Aaron is talking about here, we are not projecting that this is going to happen. And I think both of us agree that the I, I'm always sensitive to it, that we're not medical experts. I know that people don't like the the terms of severe, serious, less severe, minor. Um, a concussion is a concussion. It, it impacts people differently. And that, you know, it's very difficult to project that. And I know you bring up in other situations that it's not clean and linear. It doesn't mean that when this happens, this is going to happen. And this is how long that's going to take. We don't know. I will say, I agree with everything you said, that the things we've seen would indicate that this is in a positive frame of as far as the range of possible outcomes here, not being light sensitive, not being uh, regard, um, you know, held out of the field, able to do snapping and sled drives and, and uh, conditioning work is a positive thing. Um, so we are not projecting this could happen, but it is our job to kind of look through, hey, what could happen if we were to go without him? Um, the, anytime you sign a new contract to a free agent, there's virtually no way to get out of that immediately. Um, 
And I will say the best frame of reference is the last center that we had prior to this was when Eric Wood went to have his press conference to announce his retirement. He actually oh, couldn't wait, hold say that. <laughs> yeah. And the NFLPA said, don't say that word, because if you say that word, you're going to let the team get out of it. They need to put you on injured reserve and then release you because you get all your guaranteed money. Um, so God forbid something like that were to happen. Again, that's not what's in, in – I don't think that's even a possible outcome right now. But if he got another one, two weeks from now where something much more serious could occur um, that could put us in a position where we have to look at contract ramifications. So with his contract, he was given a four year, $44.5 million deal with an $11 million signing bonus and 26.1 million guaranteed, which is more than half the contract already guaranteed. So for layman's terms and the simplest setup, Mitch Morris is a Buffalo Bill the next two years, whether he ever plays a snap or not. There is no, there's even not even any benefit. You would pay him more to cut him and make him go away than to simply sit there on injured reserve and not to play. So Mitch Morris is a Buffalo Bill the next two years, no matter what. Um, now, again, I don't think that's the, the concern we're looking at here, but just God forbid that something bad did happen beyond this initial one. Um, after the 2020 season, going into 2021, you could walk away from his deal and only have $5.5 million in dead cap, which is doable. That's worse than the Charles Clay situation. That's not as bad as the Marcel Darius situation, uh, but is manageable at that point if, again, the very worst, worst case happens. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's likely here, um, but – as you hinted to, let's let's move into what would happen in, in real time now. There is no available center to go sign. There's no available good center to go trade for. So our options are Russell Bodine, John Feliciano, and Spencer Long. Um, Spencer Long was having kind of a, a minor thing. He had his uh, knee in a sleeve today, so he wasn't out there. I think he would be one of the top options, either him or Feliciano. But today it was Russell Bodine, and our new shiny toy, Ed Oliver, ate his lunch all day today. And Jordan Phillips and Star, uh, Star Latule and Ed Oliver just crumbled the pocket from the inside and wreaked havoc in the defense, dominated the press. So... You know, we do a defense with a defense line, but losing Mitch Morris in the short term for any extended period of time would not be good. Well, and we're not the only ones with a good defensive line, and that's going to be the problem when you lose a guy like that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be Morris. And this was something we talked about when we were talking about the offensive line and the additions to the offensive line this year and um, trying to maybe temper some of the expectations that people had because I, I saw a lot of, well, we got this guy and this guy and this guy and we're going to be so much better top 10 offensive line. I don't even see it healthy. And then when you take one of those guys away and Mitch Morris is probably the worst example because I think he was the biggest upgrade at his position and the drop off from him is so vast, probably more so than the other positions. Um, and what he provides, which is you, you mentioned it. So Ed Oliver was eating and Jordan Phillips is eating in the middle of the, the line today, but you had Feliciano on one side of him and Spain on the other side of him. And I think Spain's probably a fine offensive lineman. I don't know that he's as, as good as his PFF grades indicate that he is, but I think he's fine. But a lot of his success is going to become from playing with Mitch Morris. When you put him next to Russell Bodine or maybe even Spencer Long, I don't know, or Feliciano, that's going to change his ability to perform. It's just how the interior of the line works, even really how the tackles work, even though the tackles get left out on an island from time to time. You're not going to see Deion Dawkins get left out on an island a lot, but they really play off one another. So today I it was scary to me to hear, I think they said in like the team drills, which is very limited uh, amount of actual snaps when you are sitting there watching it. It's maybe, what, 20 plays? 25 plays of team drills and they were saying Allen would have been sacked four times. Uh, that's not a great number and that's not what I want to see. And it, it, if that's what this line is going to be like when you miss one piece, man, that is something that's scary to me and something that probably still needs to get addressed in the next draft and continuing to develop that actual depth behind some of these top end starters. No, I agree. And I think we've had some good questions in the chat here. So I think from AJ's standpoint, um, I think there is a, a, a flip side to that in that it was encouraging to hear that Ed Oliver was wreaking havoc today. And I know, you know, we kind of temper 
little bit a couple times or something. He got over and maybe pushed line into Josh Allen. And that maybe some of that was head positioning, not seeing where Allen stepped up into, but there's no scenario where it's okay to hurt Josh Allen, accident or not, whether it's the offensive lineman's fault or not. You can't push somebody into the legs, Josh Allen. So um but beyond that, having it you know, kind of reported and a couple of people saying that it was difficult to functionally run plays to be able to do that because of Ed Oliver wreaking havoc up the middle. That's pretty fun to hear. And that I know people were waiting for him to kind of get unleashed here and, and see, hey, did we really get as good of a guy as what we did? Today felt pretty good to reassure us that he really could be a monster. Yeah, I don't I didn't doubt that he's gonna come in and have an impact. What I think they were doing was just playing smart into letting him come into it here in this week. I think it was uh, decided a long time ago that they weren't going to put him out here right away and get him going early. And it was almost a humbling thing. I think we talked about that a little bit in our, you know, live from training camp thing that he was not getting as many looks. I think in the two days I was there, he only got two looks with the ones. And in one of those looks, he did get a sack. So I fully expected once he starts to get that burn that he is going to wreak havoc and be that guy. I mean, we're going to see the rookie mistakes and stuff, but I think he's going to be really difficult for any large uh, NFL guy to really get their hands on him just because of his athleticism. I think he's going to create a lot of problems. Obviously he'll, he'll have his struggles, but um, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's encouraging to see that. And it really, I mean, the way the guys are stepping up on the defensive side of the ball. I mean, I know it's training camp and you try not to get too hyped. And also at times that also means maybe your offense isn't doing something right, but it's hard to not see what's happening on the defensive side of the ball and think that they can maintain their status as one of the most elite defenses in the league and maybe even improve on it. No, and, and I think there's other names we've heard there too. I've heard Jordan Phillips name multiple times, and that's exciting to have two penetrating three technique players that we may be, may be able to rotate the two of them darn close to 50 50 or whatever the snap count they end up getting based on you know Shaq Lawson can play some pass rush uh, defensive tackle so can Zoe um, but having that kind of alignment is really exciting I know the one that we uh, were going back and forth and you brilliantly named the Demogorgon got us all excited yesterday the alignment that had three defensive linemen of Jerry Hughes uh Ed Oliver and Trent Murphy, then three linebackers of Lorenzo Alexander, uh, Tremaine Edmonds, and Matt Milano, all six lined up across the defensive line in, in each of the six gaps, and then the nickel defense behind them, and that you have no idea which four of those six are coming, and all six are athletic enough to drop back into coverage, whichever two, even if they drop back Ed Oliver and Jerry Hughes, they can cover a, a hook zone in a defense to be able to do that and send the other four, especially putting Milano and Edmonds in those double A-gap blitz. Um, that's really exciting to be able to kind of scare a defense like that. It is, and uh, I hate to always be the guy that's trying to say, well, let's temper things. I I am super excited by that. I expect to maybe see that a couple times a game, popping up very specifically, hey, we need to really create some pressure on this yeah. third down. Critical like, third and three. Yeah, let's throw some confusion out there. That's things they don't see a lot on tape. I, I still expect there to be a lot of kind of base uh, packaging of what they're going to run out there, and that's primarily what we saw uh, for the most of the week. Um, so let's go through because I think we both saw some guys uh, that maybe are trending upwards and maybe some guys that are trending downwards. I'll pitch it to you to, to start this off. Who, who's a guy that either up or down uh, that you weren't expecting to see? Um, so I wrote about it a little on, on Twitter uh, as we were watching live, but out of anyone who made the biggest impression for me positively was Corey Thompson. Um and only in the sense of I didn't really realistically have him making the roster or even really being in the running with the signing of Mo Alexander and the drafting of Voshan Joseph. And some people liked uh, UDFA Terrell Dodson. And I really just had him as kind of a camp body. And Deion Lacey led the team in special team snaps last year. I just didn't see any path that he realistically had a shot. And I'll say, one, he looked explosive and fast. He was the first guy rotating in any second team uh, reps into the first team. When they gave Zoe the day off on Sunday, he was the other. He was the starting strong side linebacker. Um, in every special teams unit, he was in the first run for both kickoff and punt coverage and some of the gunner drills. Um, 
So I'm, I would say Corey Thompson certainly made a difference from the 53 man projection I made last week. He would have stepped forward there and probably made the most surprising impact on me, even if not the best. There were other guys who I thought looked better and were more impressive, but was certainly the most surprising name for me to walk away with. Wow. He really, you know, made an impression on me. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, totally. And I agree with why you're you're choosing him there. Uh, mine is going to be a little bit maybe more of an obvious and more safe uh, guy. And that's EJ Gaines is when I'm th when I the two days I was there and some of the stuff I've seen even before I was there and, and going is I keep hearing his name pop up. But it's weird to me because he doesn't seem to be getting the um, burn in the media or with the team when they're talking about this cornerback battle, but I, he's the guy that I see getting his hand on balls, not really getting beat, being in position. And again, he's the guy and the guy that has to stay healthy and he wasn't healthy in OTAs, but so far so good health wise. Um, and he's picked up right where he left off in this defense, which I think this defense is a perfect fit for him and a perfect scenario for him to, to thrive in. Um, and, I'd like to see him really battle for the second cornerback position after listening to Leslie Frazier uh, was it yesterday. It doesn't seem like that's much of a battle that it's more Levi Wallace and he has to lose the job. Then maybe the other guys are going to come and take it from him. That's what I took out of that press conference. But uh, gosh, if EJ Gaines is your fourth cornerback, that is going to be a really good position for the bills to be in uh, or even Kevin Johnson, either one of those guys, because Kevin didn't pop for me uh, and wasn't making plays, but he also wasn't getting beat. Uh, which is good enough too, right? Like it doesn't have to be flashy. Um, but yeah, man, EJ Gaines really stood out to me. And and I tried not to, maybe I thought maybe I was overthinking it, but it, the more I kept thinking about it, he re just was really playing well. No, I agree. And and I think you brought this up in the, the Slack channel as well, that he hasn't gotten a lot of love on Twitter, which is odd. I, I don't know. We kicked around some reasons why, but it, he, he, I agree. He stood out and was consistently making plays on the ball, never getting beat, um, flexibility both in the slot and in the outside. So I agree. I, I think he really stood out. And I, I saw a couple plays that Kevin Johnson won. He lost his footing and still had the short area explosion to get back into it and knock the ball down. Um, so that stood out to me was a minor one, but um, you could tell that the team was there. I'll say another guy that was a new addition um, – Kurt Coleman is not on the roster bubble. <laughs> Kurt no. Coleman, Kurt Coleman is absolutely the third safety, the veteran in that room. He was pulling aside Levi Wallace and Abraham Wallace and Saran Neal every other play in their ear talking to them, and you could tell there was a level of respect in, in how they were approaching him. Um, so Kurt Coleman is solidly the third safety, going to be at the front line of every special teams unit, uh, some big nickel lineups. Um, he is a roster lock now after seeing it in person. Yeah, and another guy that I had – well, here, I'll switch over to maybe a guy who's down in because we're talking I – don't, I don't want anyone to call me a homer on Twitter that I'm not down on anybody. A uh, guy that I'm down on, um, Deion Dawkins. Okay. I We talked about it on this uh, podcast here that I really wanted him to not only just be – okay at tackle i really wanted him to take a step forward and prove to me this is a make or break year he took to twitter to say that he wasn't in good enough shape and didn't try hard enough or whatever his tweet was about not just the not being all there last year i didn't like that that i like that he admitted it but i didn't like that he got himself into that spot uh so having the self-awareness to come out and say that you better come out this summer and really be markedly better in my opinion if you're gonna say that and he is just not yet and i know it's super early um but i saw him get beat a number of times he's just i mean he's going up against jerry hughes i get it that's a hard guy to block every practice and stuff like that so i'm sure there's some good tape on there when they roll practice back but he has not looked the part to me of a franchise left tackle and i think he'll get the full year at tackle and i think they'll give him every opportunity to solidify this spot but at the end of this year, man, if I'm Brandon Bean, I'm looking at my board, I'm searching for an answer at that position if he doesn't really improve. No, I, I think that's fair. And I, I was the same way on some of the back end wide receivers. I, I thought that we obviously all went in and everyone was debating on, hey, how in the world are we going to keep both the amazing uh, guy of David Sills and Duke Williams? And I got bad news for you guys. They're probably ninth and 10th in the wide receiver pecking order here. Um, there was an awful lot of guys ahead of them. Um, David Sills, seeing in person, is not an impressive physical specimen. Uh, really thin frame. Um, 
I know he's listed at 211. I would have guessed he's 190. Um, and he might be 211, and it may be just kind of deceiving in how he's built, but uh, did not look like an NFL athlete yet. Now, I think that some of the excitement about his ability to do 50 50 balls and go up for it means that I'm still very open to him making the practice squad. But I can't lie, if if I was making the decision today, um, some of the guys like Ray Ray McLeod or Isaiah McKenzie or heck, Cam even Phillips, Nick- even. Camp Phillips got a ton of run with the first yeah. team. There's a lot of guys way in the pecking order ahead of him. I know I tweeted that Duke Williams, once the pads went on, there were a couple of physical reps where you could see his um, his physicality and, and build being beneficial, and that if that translates into some special teams reps, maybe he can sneak in there. But um, that's another area that – you know, I'm not sure who I would project there, but because of the depth of other areas, I probably wouldn't have a sixth receiver today. I would rather keep TJ Yeldon or Jason Kroom as a fourth tight end or an extra linebacker like Corey or Thompson. The, yeah, Mo Alexander, Sarah, yeah. these guys that we talked about. Absolutely. I, I would rather go that route. Right now, I think it's there is a huge line. I think that you have um, John Brown and Cole Beasley are the two starting receivers. I think they're going to be out there for almost every rep. I think in two wide receiver sets, Cole Beasley is going to get a lot of them. Um, Zay Jones was definitively third and probably neck and neck with Beasley. Robert Foster was fourth and behind those three, but ahead of most everybody else and right there with Andre Roberts. And then there was a big gap and that everybody else got one or two reps and but it was six other guys getting one or two reps. So um, those top five of you know John Brown, Cole Beasley, Robert Foster, Zay Jones, and Andre Roberts are way ahead of everybody else. And right now, I would have just those five and no sixth receiver. I'd rather keep the depth at one of the other spots and try to sneak those guys out of the practice squad. That's funny because I uh, I think today McDermott said about Ray Ray. McLeod being hot, having the sixth receiver, like he's ahead in that battle. And I was joking that that's because they're not going to keep six. Uh, uh, he's the first guy that's getting it, not getting, or the last guy to get cut, you know, yeah, uh, he's the sixth receiver. Like Tyree Jackson's the third quarterback. Like yeah, someone I mean, got to be third. So it gets to be you. It doesn't mean you're making the roster. And there's still plenty of time left. That's why I, I like right now, what guy I am down on foster from the first start of practice that I saw. And then we, we heard uh, McDermott come out and talk about it. And so he put it, out there to everyone in the media that foster is not living up to the expectations uh that were set for him for this year too so it's not that my eyes deceived me and that that he didn't look the same so but he's got plenty of time i know there's a lot of panic on twitter and people talking about him getting cut and i don't think we're there yet with any of this we've got weeks left to go uh and it's not uh free agency or not free agency, uh, training camp isn't the way it used to be where it came in uh staggered waves of cuts these guys have a longer time to really make an impact to, to stay on the roster where it's just that one big cut, right? Right before the season yeah, starts right, now. All the way down, all the way down yeah. to just straight from 90 to 53. Yeah. So these guys have plenty of practices, plenty of time. I mean, think about how many opinions change just in the first four practices. Yeah. So there's plenty of time for these opinions to continue to change. But as of right now, I'm down on, on Foster and I'm up on Andre Roberts, a guy who yeah. so I did not than i expected yeah i thought this was you know when i always joke around about making my 53 man roster and i have just special teams guys i got news for you andre roberts is not just special teams he is going to have a role in this offense and it might be a similar snap count to patrick demarco uh but it's gonna be yeah i think they're gonna try to get him the ball and get him in space because that's what it looked like from what i saw there He's a better version of Isaiah McKenzie, if we're being yeah. honest. I mean, he's really similar. He's going to be a kick returner. He's going to be a punt returner. He's going to get bubble screens. He's going to get jet sweep uh, end arounds and the little flip tosses. Um, and he's going to do it better than Isaiah McKenzie did. So um, he's that exact role that people like last year, except an upgraded model of it uh, to be there. And I know that Dustin and a handful of other guys in the chat were asking, and lots of other people, you know, as, as Aaron said, we can both be down on Robert Foster and kind of temper the discussion that, hey, everybody who thought he was going to take that five game run and just extrapolate that into 16 games and now be wide receiver one, you know, come on, dial it back here. But it also doesn't mean we're the other, other end of the spectrum. He still showed those flashes last year. He still has potential. He's still getting way more first team reps than any of the other guys we rattled off like Duke Williams and David Sills and, and Victor Bolden. 
so and he's a UDFA dirt cheap contract. So yeah, he's not actually at risk to get cut. Like he still has potential and is going to be here to do those things. So, you know, I think he's definitively wide receiver four. I think Andre Roberts is pushing him for wide receiver four, but he's not going to get cut. So, I mean, there, there's a big gap between those two things. And then, uh, yeah, another guy I'm trending up on and I shouldn't be surprised by this, but I think maybe I was just because of your hype about him was like, Greg's never right about stuff like this. So this can't be true, but John Brown uh, looks the part of the probably right now, if I had to guess the best weapon uh, outside of Josh Allen that this offense has, uh, and that's just not being able to really see the run game. I think shady pr- still has the potential to be one of the bigger playmakers on this team, but f- from the, the practices I saw and all the reports that I'm hearing out of camp, John Brown was open almost every single play. Uh, Josh Allen was looking to him first. He, he was really, he saw him and was going to him first and it was more than just fly routes and go routes and stuff like that. He was catching passes over the middle slants, uh, just different stuff over the middle, uh, you know, in zone, he was sitting in the gap, finding his spots. He looked the part of maybe not the traditional, alpha male wide receiver one but for this team i think it's a pretty big difference between his skill set and what he provides as that go-to guy and everyone else i love cole beasley he's got a very different specific skill set i love zay jones but again he's just he's more of a guy that he's not going to make a lot of mistakes i think brown is really the playmaker so far in camp and and maybe going into the year is the biggest playmaker on this team yeah, and, and you know, I I I did pull a muscle, patting myself on the back uh, earlier today. Um, but no, I I was a big fan of John Brown coming uh, coming out. I wanted him badly last year. I he was my number one receiver target this year in free agency. So getting him, I was excited. I was over invested because I had made that call. But seeing him, it is very real. And I'll, I'll give you guys the one play to watch out for that you're going to see over and over and over again. Everybody knows he can run a fly pattern and stress the team deep. What that's going to give is one of the best routes that Josh Allen throws is not the 40-yard bomb. It's threatening the 40-yard bomb, having an insanely quick receiver stop at 15 yards and turn that into a quick out on the far sideline where Josh Allen has the arm strength to gun it in there that Nathan Peterman always used to throw the pick six on, that play. They're going to run that play all the time, all the time. Yeah. John Brown is going to threaten the fly. He's going to get the corner to bail out. And as soon as the corner turns to bail out, he's going to put the brakes on, have a quick out, and they're going to they're going to cut it there and catch that over and over again. And Dustin just said it, the exact thing I was going to. As soon as they get the corner to be afraid of that and to then play that once, he's going to give a stutter step to the outside and burn him deep for a touchdown. And that's going to happen multiple times this season. And it's going to be really exciting to be able to see a guy like that. And his his footwork, his explosion, his ability to get in and out of cuts without slowing down is just different than anybody we've had in a long time. And he's not Julio Jones. He's not A.J. Green or Mike Evans or DeAndre Hopkins. He's not that kind of wide receiver one. But he is going to be a fun weapon. And I know uh, you and I did it in the parking lot with Eric outside the uh, the show when we were together, uh, being able to see camp on Saturday. His version of catch radius and how he's able to track the ball is going to be a really exciting, um, really exciting element to add to a guy like Josh Allen. Yeah. And one thing I noticed that won't show up in box scores or show up in any type of analytics was. For all the plays he was making, you never see you would see him make a catch, make a fantastic play and just give the ball back and get back to work. I think he's a guy that's got a chip on his shoulder. He had a little bit of success in this league with Carson Palmer, and that has gone away since then. And I think people are down on him. He probably didn't get the interest that he deserved in free agency and fans are down on him. Everybody's down on him right now. So I think that the bills are probably using that to their advantage. They like that and guys, guys with chips on their shoulder and something to prove. And so that's a, a I think a benefit that, it's one of those things like momentum that you either believe in it or don't, but that guy's the body language that I saw from him was a guy that was there specifically to work and to put it in. And he wasn't there to showboat or anything like that. He was just getting his plays in and, and he's coming to work. Um, and we saw some pretty good reps against a Trey white. So it's not like he was just beating oh, yeah. up on, on the defensive, you know, the second string defensive backs. He was beating up on some of the top defensive backs in the league. And I, he was the only guy to give it to Trey. Every other one-on-one rep, Trey won. 
handily and is able to read and take care of every other guy. He could not get a read on John Brown. And John, they get him into the stem where he's ready to make that cut or to keep going or to slant or to cut back or to curl or to go out. And Trey could not read him. And John Brown got him three reps in a row when they were going against each other. And to one point that I think one of the guys had to kind of come over and put his arm around Trey because he was getting down on himself for getting frustrated, for getting beat. And you just, nobody does that to him. So having somebody who's capable of doing that is really exciting. And and I know he, uh, John Brown was actually on one bills live today with John Murphy and, and the team over there. And um, they put it to him exactly how we're talking about it and saying, Hey, is it exciting to finally get a chance to be wide receiver one? And he was not only gracious about it, but, immediately dismissive of no 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 that's not what i'm here for you know i'm here to play a role and to fit in on this team we have some really talented guys who are all going to have their moments to shine and to flash and he was very very um careful to praise the rest of the guys on the team and that he's just here to do his own part and that you can tell he's the exact kind of dna that mcdermott was looking for absolutely for me maybe the last guy and i'm not down on him i'm just surprised how little we saw in the first week we saw today uh, him get a, a look at starters was Ty Secchi. I was very excited about him as a free agent acquisition. Obviously, drafting forward changed some of that excitement for him, but I still thought that, uh, you know, just historically, uh, McDermott being all these guys have favored the veteran uh, in these scenarios, at least start camp, that he would come out and be the starting guy. He wasn't. Ford started, what, four days in a row? Ford got the start, and then Inseki okay. comes out. Yeah, yeah today, 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 comes out the today and gets the start. I don't know if that was, hey, we evaluated some of the film and we want to maybe see this guy instead of just giving the job to Ford, or if this was the planned, hey, let's get the rookie in and, and learn as much as he can in these sets, and then we'll install, you know, with with Inseki. I don't know where their head is at, but I was disappointed that we didn't see Inseki running with the ones at really any point up until today. Yeah, and... I think you're on to something there that, that I don't know how much of it this is. So obviously having Cody Ford get every single first day rep for the first four practices, five practices is a thing. That's not nothing. I think there's a piece of it, and I don't know if it's a small piece of it or a big piece of it, that they know what they have with Ty Inseki. There's a ton of NFL caliber film of him already against NFL caliber defensive linemen and in real game situations that they know relatively what he is and what he can and can't be. And they don't know that with Cody Ford, that the Big 12 is different. Lincoln Riley had a very fast-paced offense. There's not a ton of great defensive ends in the Big 12. And that he, a lot of guys, because of what we saw, being uh, Eric brought it out, that, hey, they've really focused on the middle three, creating a pocket that Josh Allen can step up to and leaving the two tackles out on an island. And that's where you saw some of the snaps that you were frustrated with Deion Dawkins and the same with Cody Ford, that when Trent Murphy had him going around the corner there, it, they weren't sure. So I think some of that was planned that they needed an extended period of time to be able to see what they have. Can Cody Ford be the long-term right tackle from day one? And I've put it out there that my preferred de- offensive line would be Deion Dawkins at left tackle, Quentin Spain at left guard, Mitch Morris at center, please God forbid, um, maybe Feliciano at center if Mor- Morris needs a minute, then Cody Ford at right guard and Ty Secchi at right tackle. Um I think that Cody Ford is a dominant physical presence, a road grader. But if they're going to try to do that middle three, giving Allen the the area to step up and then putting the two tackles on the outside, Eric has brought it up on several occasions. Ty Insecki's footwork is just far superior to Cody Ford and Deion Dawkins, for that matter. And that if you're going to leave a guy out there, that's the skill that you need. So I'm hopeful we actually start seeing that. I'd love to see that kind of motion. Um, I'd love to see Ford start getting some reps at right guard just to see how that looks. Um, but I, I'm hopeful that we see more of that as we go here. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else for you on the uh, up or down currently? I mean, well, our next topic kind of goes in line with that, but yeah, two minor ones. Um, I literally didn't remember that Jaquan Johnson was a human on our football team over the two days I was there because when I went back to look at my roster breakdown and was um, trying to figure out, hey, who would I bump out if I put in Corey Thompson? I was like, oh, yeah. We drafted Jaquan Johnson, and I think he plays safety, and I don't remember him existing the entire two days I was there. So I, I'm going to say that's a negative because I literally forgot that he was there. 
Um, and then the one positive was another guy I brought up that I put Eli Harold as that uh, defensive end number four. You're a big Eddie Yarborough fan. Um, there's plenty of guys that you know want to see some other rotation there. Mike Love is far and away defensive four, defensive end number four right now. He was the only guy rotating in with the first team. He was getting every second team rep um, when they had kind of a one v one. They had the rest of the team over there on another on another field, so they only had like Taron Johnson, Kurt Coleman. Corey Thompson and Mike Love. Those are the only four guys there with the first team defense rotating in. And um, he was getting almost equal reps to Shaq Lawson at some points. Um, so Mike Love was another guy that really stepped up for me in that where they see him and that what he's doing. So if I were to change that today, that's another change I would make. I had projected Eli Harold as making the 53 and being the uh, defensive end number four. And right now I've updated that to Mike Love. Yeah, I would say uh, not only... Mike Love, but the the more of a thing against Yarbrough and uh, Harold is that Daryl Johnson was getting yeah, those next. Yeah, I, like, uh, was fifth. yeah, that's who was fifth, and that is crazy to me because I actually expected. You know, I didn't have a ton of uh, Harold. I wasn't big on Harold very. You know, going into this at all, but for a guy like Daryl Johnson, who I, I really think is a prime practice squad guy, he's got the body size, but just needs a year in the weight room maybe and learn how to use that leverage. He's a super long guy. If he can use, use that leverage and bulk up a little bit, I think he can be a, a nice rotational piece on this defense, but you wouldn't think he would be getting the burn over these other guys who you really have to make a decision if you're going to keep or not. Um, so I was, I was pretty shocked at that. So I think that's an indictment. Maybe um, I hate, I hate to say that so early on, but I think it was a little bit of indictment on both uh Harold and Yardborough. Yeah, well, and sadly, they're both in the same situation. Neither of them are eligible for the practice squad. They've been in the NFL too long. They both had too many um, accrued game reps to right. now be beyond that. So Daryl Johnson, uh, David Sills, um, Jaquan Johnson, some of those guys have the cushion that – um, Bean and his team are going to be weighing it to say, hey, who can we afford to expose to waivers and sneak onto the practice squad versus guys that we can just outright cut and try to sign back? Yeah. Um, so that's going to be the balance of where that gets into. That's going to be Dean Marlowe versus Jaquan Johnson. That's going to be um, Dion Lacey versus Voshan Joseph. That's going to be uh, Mike Love versus Eli Harold. Very similar situations in each of those where one of them's practice squad eligible and one's not. And I'm curious to see how much of a factor that plays. Yeah, and that's kind of we're kind of morphing into the the topic we wanted to go on, which was kind of like roster surprises. We both kind of did our 53 man projections way too soon. Yeah. Uh, just because it's a fun exercise yeah, when there's nothing else going on. Um, but so like one for me, and you brought it up with uh, Johnson uh, saying that you didn't know he was on the field. Uh, the only reason I noticed him on the field was because I, the two days I was at camp, I saw a lot of Sierra Neal as the nickel backup in the second defense, uh, getting a lot of those looks as the nickel. And I think that that to me signifies that he's probably maybe more of a guy that's going to be on this roster than I thought when we were talking about the safeties, I thought that maybe if he doesn't really step up, um, that, you know, it's kind of bust for him, but I, if he's going to be the backup nickel and there, it didn't see, I don't think he took a single safety rep in the two days I was there. So I think they're really bringing him up as this guy to play that position, which he played a little bit in college, but he played it jacksonville state yeah uh he's the most athletic guy in the, so he played linebacker safety corner like he was just more athletic than anybody he probably could have played running back if he wanted to and yeah. broke all their records you know he's just one of those guys but i think they see something there that he can play nickel and man if he can if they can make that kind of project work that that body size and and bringing that extra guy in that defense that we were talking about earlier, uh, the Demogorgon defense that I talked about. If you have him in there at the nickel. Oh, him uh, instead of Taron Johnson or him or Kurt Coleman there, and you could put yeah. seven guys across the defensive line. Oh, that's terrifying. Um, and that type of body. So I was, a that was a roster surprise to me. Not that, uh, whether or not he's going to make the team, but just where he was lining up and not lining up at safety at all. Well, and to, to double down on that, Saran Neal was the first guy in the gunner drill for every right. special team unit, and he was the outside gunner number one guy on the first team kickoff unit. So um, I have a feeling that he is locked in as the number one special teams guy on the mm -hmm. roster, um, even ahead of uh, Cenerys Perry or uh, Mole Alexander or Deion Lacey, Lafayette Pitts, those kind of guys. Um 
I think he's the number one guy there, and I agree. I think that they're molding him into that kind of versatile piece that they can use as a backup nickel when they want to go big nickel um, versus Kurt Coleman might be more of a traditional third safety when they actually have three safety looks, which right. I think te- a lot of guys – I think confusing. a lot of fans – that's not the exact same thing uh three safety is often more zone whereas nickel you're having a guy he's guarding a guy not that Ter- Taron johnson can't also do zone on the inside but just some don't different get looks. eric started yeah, on that we'll, you're being, you know, at me. Yeah, <laughs> we'll be we'll be dry we were driving home and somebody said uh i think coleman coming in as the big nickel and he was like it's a three safety look yeah. that's all it is yeah. so don't get yeah. eric started on big nickel for terms any fans yeah if you want to get eric triggered he he'll yell at us for misusing big nickel versus three safety um, absolutely no th- those guys were there i thought that was a a really good one um i know i brought up a handful of different guys there but obviously one of the um, parts I think part of it was out of necessity, but Tommy Sweeney looked pretty good. Um, and I think that obviously we don't have any tight ends that are physically capable of walking right now. So when Tyler Croft, Jason Kroom, and Dawson Knox were all out, you know, you only have so many options. So Lee Smith right. and and Dawson and uh, Tommy Sweeney were getting reps. But I'll say Tommy Sweeney looked okay. Like he looked uh, a little bit more nimble than I expected of what I assumed was maybe just a lumbering big uh, physical guy, an old school 70s, 80s tight end. Um, And he does look like that. He looks like the, you know, Mark Bavaro 80s, just big lumbering tight end guy. Um, But he moved okay. I, I was at least reassured that, hey, if we have to use him for something, he might be a functional football player that can fit, fit in for us. But we definitely need um, either uh, – and I will say as a minor positive note from a injury update, um, Tyler Croft came out of his walking boot and was in yeah. running shoes at practice and going through some light agility drills. So that was at least a positive. Yeah, and actually to double back to the up and down, um, I didn't even think of it until we started talking about this because he just got injured uh, here recently. But I was very impressed with Knox we've both been pumping the brakes on him uh here on this podcast just he doesn't have the production and we're not really sure if he's going to be able to come in and pick it up and pick up this NFL offense because he wasn't asked to do anything that an actual real tight end is going to be asked to do at this level as far as route concepts and things like that it seemed like he was picking up with a really good start to training camp he was getting quite a bit of targets he was beating guys um he looks the part you know, you yeah, talked about how big, big, yeah, yeah. You talked about how big Sweeney was. Honestly, I swear to God, if you look out on the field and didn't know what numbers those guys were, all the tight ends, they all look exactly yeah. the same mold, just big lumbering tight ends, but they are all very different. You know, uh, and Knox has a lot more athleticism than these other guys. So him getting hurt uh, was a bummer to me because I think he was trending up. And when he comes back, I hope he continues on that trend up because that's a, a huge benefit to the offense if he can even live up to half the hype uh, that some of draft Twitter was in on him. Yeah, and he was doing the jugs machine and full ladder drills uh, for agility. So that seems like he's getting close to coming back, and maybe they're just being cautious with this, which I sure. appreciate. Yeah, you do know, it. Especially with the rest of the injuries you got to be careful with. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Uh, Dawson Knox, one wears 88 and one wears 89, and they both kind of ride up on their shoulder pads. It was genuinely difficult to know who was who when you yeah. were looking at the guys out there. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of funny. You, you joked about that when they were all standing together. Like, oh, yeah, we have a type. Yeah, <laughs> that is our type. No, I don't mind that type. No, no, <laughs> and especially a guy like Knox, who actually has legitimate uh, athleticism and that you know didn't have the production that a TJ Hawkinson did, but measurables and athleticism, he was equal or better than TJ Hawkinson in many of those areas, a guy who went eighth overall. So, you know, I, I think that you brought it up um, in one of our other discussions that one of the areas that again, we spent so much time kind of tempering people's expectations for Knox because of going from the elementary school offense and Ole Miss to the graduate level of Dable and what he does with tight ends is he did play quarterback all through high school and that there is a greater perspective and a greater uh, ability to process uh, offenses when you're in that phase than just a guy who went from a simple two-route you know, tight end mindset and that maybe we did underestimate a little bit of that, of what he was going to be able to digest and understand in an NFL playbook. So I I don't know if that was a big factor or just a minor bonus, but just something that maybe we underestimated uh, in his ability to process. Yeah, no, definitely. And uh, I'll say another guy for a roster surprise that 
It's not a big one because I don't really particularly care this deep into the running backs. But to start camp, I was surprised that Singletary seems to be really immersed as the third running back. And Yeldon was not getting any of that at all. In fact, Singletary, I think, is going to be a little bit bigger part of this offense than I assumed uh, in that they're going to try to get him some burn here this year. And I don't know that TJ Yeldon has a spot on this roster or not i just i can't tell he didn't really flash anything for me and obviously i i only got one day of running right because i only saw the one day in pads and you're not going to get anything out of the run game unless you're in pads so i i only got the one day but i haven't really seen anything from him outside of that but uh singletary impressed me he's got hands he's got soft hands he knows where to be in space um he looked like he was running hard and i got nothing out of yeldon is yeldon on the bubble here, I know he's one of the only guys we would have next year. Yeah, so I'll say you you did miss a little bit on Sunday where, in the again, in the running game uh, areas and, again, some uh, swing passes and, and out of the backfield, Yeldon did flash a little bit on Sunday. So I think okay. he looked okay and was definitely a bigger part of the plan there, but is still definitively fourth. He is definitively fourth behind. Um, as you're in reps, it is – you know, Shady gets every single first first team rep. Gore probably gets the most reps of anybody. Right. Um, Singletary has looked really good. I think Singletary for for as down as I was on draft night and as frustrated as I was that we use the seventy fourth pick on a running back. Devin Singletary looks like a legit real player. That dude's got some some of that like hard to measure natural instinctual wiggle that he makes really good guys like Matt Milano embarrassingly fall down in a heap that he just jukes everybody. It is honestly very similar to a young LaShawn McCoy. Yeah. And, and um, you know, so I, I'm a lot more excited about that pickup than I was a couple months ago. Um, but I will say Yeldon looked better on uh, Sunday than he did where he didn't really get much run at all on Saturday. Um, so it all depends. And a lot of guys are asking in the chat, is Yeldon or Perry going to make the 53 right now? I have both of them making the 53 Perry solely a special teams. He's not a running back in any other term than the label they had to give him. I saw him get one rep out of both days of uh, both Saturday and Sunday, and one of them was the last rep of a drill where it was throwing him a bone more than anything else. Right. Um, but he is a great special teams player and is right there with Saran Neal and uh, Mo Alexander and some of the first reps was on the first team kickoff unit. So he's right there in the running for that and probably competing with a Lafayette Pitts and a Deion Lacey. I think one of those three, Centuries Perry, Deion Lacey, or Lafayette Pitts is going to make that final spot as the final special teams guy. As of today, I had it as Centuries Perry, but it could flip to Lafayette Pitts or Deion Lacey. I think one of those three make it. I have TJ Yeldon making it right now as the, let's count it, the ninth offensive weapon of the running backs plus wide receivers. So as of today, I think he showed more than a David Sills, Duke Williams, Victor Bolden, Ray Ray McLeod, and that the versatility that he did catch 55 balls for the Jaguars last year, look good out of the backfield, can still be a weapon on offense, even if it is out of the backfield and you know, motioning into the slot. He motioned into the slot a ton for the Jaguars last year and ran straight up wide receiver routes. Um, so I think that I have him making the roster right now as, hey, someone's going to be that fourth running back, sixth receiver, fourth tight end kind of guy, and that I put him a notch above that mess at the end of the wide receivers. Yep. And here, real quick, I saw uh, Jake Billings is talking about as long as DeMarco's gone, no fullback need in 2019. I have bad news. <laughs> I know we've talked about it quite a bit on this podcast about that. I don't think they're going to get rid of DeMarco after watching practice. Not only do I not think they're going to get rid of DeMarco, I think he's going to have more of a role than he had a year ago. They had him out there uh, primarily. Uh, that first day in pads, he was part of almost every offensive snap for everything in team drills. He was involved, uh, motioning, doing all kinds of playing things, tight he, end. playing tight some end. tight end. He is going to be a part of this team and more so than a year ago. I'm not, again, I'm not saying he's going to get a crazy snap count. And I think there's still, still going to be people mid season that are mad that he has a roster spot, but I, I thought he was a lock going into training camp. And after seeing what I saw, he's more, I, he's solidified as a lock on this Absolutely. team. So whoever is mad about it, I think they got to get over it. And to, if you're going to sit out here and say that, um, you know, not to pick on Jake here, but Jake's saying uh, fullbacks 
no fullback needed in 2019. If you look at the best offenses in the league, Kansas City, uh, the, the Rams, Rams the, the Patriots, Patriots, everybody's running a fullback. And you look at uh, Shanahan's often touted as one of the top minds in football. He's got a fullback. Uh, everybody's using a fullback that's running a potent offense right now. Yeah, and, and again, using a fullback doesn't mean – Going back to 80s style goal line out, offense that yeah. we're running the ball 70% of the time. The key is the versatility that it gives you. In that last year, Patrick DeMarco played 15% of the offensive snaps. That is one in every seven or eight offensive snaps. But that doesn't mean that you can just eliminate that. So keeping DeMarco and saying he's a lock doesn't mean, oh, I now expect him to play 30% of the offensive snaps. It just means that, hey, in in Brian Dable's the offense, you need a fullback 15% of the time. On the snaps that you need it, he's a pretty good one. He can be versatile out of the backfield. He can catch the ball. He can block. He's also a captain and great in the locker room, and he played the fourth most special team snaps for us last year. So he's providing his value. Now, in the in the premium slack, I did talk about the fact that next year, would I prefer that we had an H-back type tight end slash uh, H-back slash fullback who can also play special teams and contribute in a versatile role? Yes, I would prefer that it be that kind of combination. And next year, when DeMarco is 32 and in the final year of his contract with no dead cap and that you could release him for free, I think we could replace him. Right now, that guy is not on the roster. That's not the kind of athlete that Tommy Sweeney is. That's not the kind of size or um, you need agility to be able to go in the hole. And if we want to get value from signing Frank Gore, you need Patrick DeMarco because you're right. LaShawn McCoy, people bring up, doesn't need a fullback and can run single back sets. You're right. He does. But Frank Gore runs great behind a fullback. And the reason we got Frank Gore was to run between the tackle and wear teams down in the four minute offense when we have a lead and are trying to milk it or need to convert on third and one. And that's when Patrick DeMarco and Frank Gore are going to shine. And it might still only be 15% of the snaps, but we need him for those 15%. Yeah, he's definitely a lock. Any other roster things stand up here before we uh, wrap up this show? Um, nothing crazy. So again, I think there's some battles at the tail end of the roster here. Um, I think that there is a wide open run for wide receiver six and that some of the names we rattled off that it's not impossible that a Victor Bolden or a Cam Phillips or an Isaiah McKenzie or a Ray Ray McLeod end up sneaking that sixth uh, wide receiver spot. Um, I do think that if Jason Kroom can get himself healthy, he's probably more in the running than I expected. I think we got lucky with Dawson Knox. Um, again, I'm happier about Devin Singletary. Um, I'm super happy that uh, I don't think I'm going to have to explain why Tyree Jackson is going to make the roster. Um, oh, yeah, he looks terrible. Yeah, he, he's 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 got a cannon, but he's the first one in. It, he is. He's the first one on the field every single day and wants to make sure six guys tweet that. Um, I think we have crazy depth in the secondary and we are going to maybe yeah. have some trade market on the offensive line or the secondary. So um, we got some good problems to, to deal with that we got to figure out. Obviously, right now, the first real negative news was Mitch Morris. I do think he is kind of a I, I put. Josh Allen, Mitch Morris, and Tremaine Edmonds. Those are our three indispensable guys. Now, you know, a Trey White or a Jordan Poyer or Micah Hyatt are great, but we actually have the depth that it wouldn't crumble behind them or fall apart completely yeah. even if they're not as good as them. If we lose Josh Allen, Mitch Morris, or Tremaine Edmonds, it it's going to get ugly this year. Yeah, actually, it's, it's funny because I, there was one rep with the starters where I didn't see Trey on the field. And for a second, I panicked <laughs> uh, thinking that he was hurt or something. But then I, I he wasn't hurt. And I looked out and it was Kevin Johnson and EJ Gaines with Terrence Johnson in the slot. And I said, holy crap, like this could like, God forbid anything happens to Trey and he's got to take plays off or has a game or a week or two. We could get through a game of football against a good NFL roster with this defensive backfield. Like that's probably as good as a lot of teams starters uh the three yeah. of those so I, I that made me feel good so i think you're right uh those three names are probably the biggest that we don't want to see go down yeah so you know again uh everybody's gonna be praying for uh mitch morris i i think that you touched on it that you know in the grand scheme of things we don't we are not medical experts but the the sense that he was already doing some of those physical elements was allowed to be out in the light that's at least as favorable as we're going to get in the in these in this time frame so obviously we're going to be very hopeful that uh mitch morris is back and ready to go and i would say that it's very reasonable to assume that there's no information today that would give us any fear that he's not going to be ready for week one without some kind of setback or additional issue. 
Absolutely. And I just am really happy to say that we made it through this entire podcast without even talking about Punta Palooza. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure that we'll get on it the next one. Uh, we'll have a, a in-depth Talk about segment. a teaser. Yeah. Uh, people yeah. are going to be rushing back to the next show for Punta Palooza. That's right. So let's, let's wrap this up here real quick. I do want to remind everybody to go check out cover1.net, head up to the premium section. 20 bucks, guys, gets you the full year of premium access. That includes the Slack channel, film room, all the private, all the uh, uh, premium content. You get your hands on that first. Uh, it really does help to go support the infrastructure of what we're trying to do as far as delivering content for you guys. Uh, so it's a good deal. Go out and grab it, and you get it for the full year. So it's a good time now to grab it before the season starts and it doesn't re up again until next training camp. So uh, head over again, cover1.net. Greg. You look great tonight, man. I know you're out, out there on the West Coast. Where can people find you uh, and interact with you on Twitter when you're not schmoozing uh, the clientele? Yeah, hey, it's all business all the time. Yeah. Uh, no, so you can come find me at Greg Thompson, G-R-E-G-T-O-M-P-S-E-T-T. -T. Always having fun with Bills fans. Had a great time being able to kind of give live play-by-play -play coverage at camp, but we're still going to be reacting to all the news and giving everybody everything that you can handle. Uh, so, again, yeah, come out there, uh, check us out, and I'll uh, love to uh, give everything I can on Twitter. Yeah, and uh, you can find me at Aaron Quinn 716. Uh, just just kind of getting into it as much as I can. And yeah, I agree with what Greg just said. It was fun to be out there and, and tweeting it from from camp and it doesn't feel right or that I'm getting the info that I want to see. I, I want like, uh, no, tell me this. Tell me what because you don't get to see it. So, uh, but that's all right. We're going to get through it and uh, we're going to keep coming to you guys every week and delivering this fresh content for you. So uh, make sure that you subscribe to us here on YouTube, subscribe on iTunes, give reviews all over the place spread the word uh that we're, we're doing a great job out here guys it, it really keeps us going and keeps the brand alive and it's all driven by you guys awesome thank you guys so much again uh you know share tell a friend anything you can do to, to spread the word we'd appreciate it but uh thanks for everything tonight and we will talk to you guys soon we are out